Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the past, I've discussed how nuclear weapons are designed, how they are used, but I've never really discussed the effects of them. And while they're often treated as being devices which will vaporise anything near them, and so I, like many of you out there, no doubt wondered how close could you put a physical object to this blast and have it survive the million degree fire and fury. In the 1950s and 60s, many outdoor nuclear tests were performed at the Nevada test site. And while many of these were to determine whether a new weapon worked correctly, there were lots of tests where they were just wanting to see what the effects were on infrastructure, military hardware, houses, people, livestock, forests. And you know, if you've ever seen this footage and you're like me, then you wondered how they found a pine forest in the middle of the Nevada desert. And of course, the answer is the Forestry Service basically took a whole bunch of trees, uprooted them, transported them to Nevada, and then set their roots in concrete so they could see how many of the trees would get knocked over, broken, how many would be dangerous to people nearby. This was part of the Upshot Not Whole Encore test, and the trees were set up two kilometres away from a weapon with, which was about 27 kilotons. This same test was also used to film The House in the Middle, which is a civil defence film where they basically encouraged homeowners to make sure their houses are well maintained and painted nicely because that will help them in the case of a nuclear attack. I mean, there's literally a section in this movie where they demonstrate that a house which is untidy is more likely to catch fire and therefore cleaning the house is part of your civil defence duties. But anyway, these civilian structures were several kilometres from the blast. They also, of course, tested military hardware even closer still. But everything I've shown you here has been far outside the actual fireball. This damage is all caused by the overpressures, the shock waves, and the thermal radiation given off by the giant glowing ball of plasma that is a second sun in the sky. Thanks to high frame rate cameras, it's possible to glimpse the early moments of a nuclear fireball. These videos are fascinating. They look kind of like weird alien jellyfish expanding outwards with little legs sticking out. This footage is recorded at 2400 frames per second and these uh, legs that shoot out are actually a classic feature of nuclear test footage. Many of these tests would be carried out on top of towers which were over 100 metres tall and those would be braced with wires and these filaments of flame would follow the wires down ahead of the main blast front. What's happening here is the heat from the fireball is essentially vaporising the wire because the wire can absorb heat much more efficiently than the very clear air. This is sometimes called the Indian rope trick and you can also see it happening sometimes with the tower. Now the mechanism behind the fireball itself is also interesting because uh, unlike a regular chemical explosives, what they do is they create a lot of gas and the gas expands outwards. It doesn't matter whether the gas is hot or cold, it just it makes a lot of it very quickly. With a nuclear bomb, what happens is you have a very rapid nuclear reaction and the bomb and its casing get incredibly hot and they start emitting radiation, they start emitting x-rays and those x-rays will heat, shoot off into the air and they heat up the air. And as the air gets hot, it turns into a plasma. And when the air transitions from regular air to a plasma, it actually becomes more transparent to X-rays. So initially the fireball grows because it's being made by X-rays being emitted by the bomb. And that grows very, very quickly because that's a process that's driven by light. But eventually it sort of loses steam and the material at the core of the device, it's so hot now, it's expanding out at supersonic speeds. And that starts to catch up with the fireball that's being created by the X-rays. And that's when you start to see this mottled structure in the surface. The different brightnesses on the surface of the fireball are down to the material surrounding the core of the weapon. You've, obviously, you've got the shot cab, but there's the casing of the weapon, the hardware that's used to trigger the explosives. All that is essentially being vaporized, but it retains some slight semblance of this structure. And that's where we see hot spots and uh, cold spots on the surface of this fabulously hot, high-pressure fireball. 
The fireball will grow outwards until the shock wave that's driving it uh, loses enough energy that the it's no longer heating the air to a temperature that it becomes opaque. After that, you still have the shock wave going out, but it's now invisible. The gas that's left behind, the fireball, that of course is now very light uh, because it's very, very hot, and it will start to rise up and form the characteristic mushroom cloud. And with all that energy, not much is left of the tower. This is a photo showing Oppenheimer and the remains of the Trinity Tower. That's him in the white hat with his leg up on the rubble there. He's probably say something like, I am become death destroyer of towers. And so we come back to my original question. Is it possible to have something that survives inside that fireball? And as it happens, it is because, of course, they'd had a lot of nuclear tests and they tested all sorts of things. And there was one guy called Lou Allen. And this guy had big balls, big steel balls, 10 inch, 25 centimeter steel balls and aluminium balls. And he arranged for these to be placed you know, very, very close to a detonation. How close? Well, these towers were set up so that the nearest tower, the top was about 25 meters away from the weapon and further ones were, you know, subsequently further back. There were actually test articles placed inside the cab as well. So they had a bunch of different hardware up here. They had cylinders, they had uh, spheres. The reason they used these was because they wanted to get an idea of uh, the effects on things with very simple, well-known geometries. The blast was supposed to be about 28 kilotons, but Los Alamos were messing around and had a slightly different core design that used uranium-233, and it only generated tw uh, 22 kilotons. It doesn't really matter because that fireball quickly consumed those towers and their solid steel bowling balls bathing them in million-degree high-pressure plasma before they are ejected by the pressure. So this was part of the Operation Teapot series of tests which took place in the uh, first half of 1955. And of course the results were classified, so the world didn't know how Lou Allen's solid steel balls could handle a nuclear fireball until the paper was declassified in 1980. So now we know that they did in fact recover those spheres from the desert. The only ones that weren't found were the ones that were sitting inside the shot cab with the weapon. But the one that was 25 meters away, it was discovered. It had been knocked 120 meters downrange and was found uh, one meter under the surface of the desert. However, the heavy metal bowling balls were still very much spherical. If you look at this, the ones on the right were the ones which were closest to the blast, the ones on the left are furthest away. And you'll also notice that the steel spheres have had less of their surface removed. The aluminium spheres had lost about three centimeters of their radius. Uh, but interestingly enough, the amount of mass lost by each sphere depending upon its distance was actually the same pretty much for the steel versus aluminium. What you've essentially got is the incident energy is vaporizing this material and that vapor is of course shielding the material underneath it. So it sort of seems logical that the amount of mass loss would actually be very similar. The one on the bottom had ceramic inserts. They had three different types of ceramics that they were testing. Well, one was graphite, which I guess is not really a, cer a ceramic, but you know, this was of course another uh, type of material to test. They also tested these cylinders, which were hollow. And as you can guess, the effects were pretty much similar with uh, the objects being nearer, surviving, but being a little worse for their wear. Because they were hollow, they actually were distorted by the pressures. So they did this experiment and they wrote it down, which meant that it was no longer messing around. It was, in fact, science. Did it actually benefit them? Well, they actually came up with a bunch of ideas based on this. First of all, they observed that the balls had been thrown a bit further than they'd expected, and that sort of tangentially led into the Orion project where they were looking at nuclear pulse propulsion. And it was also considered that they might put materials inside these spheres and expose them to large amounts of neutron radiation. And this actually led to a concept for generating tritium for boosted fission weapons 
using nuclear bombs. So you would detonate a nuclear bomb and you would have lithium supply and the lithium would break down and then you'd extract the tritium. So I'm going to say that the whole idea for this video actually came from somebody that mentioned that in the comments a couple of days ago. So thanks for that. There was concern at one point that there wouldn't be enough tritium uh, available from reactors to be able to feed the supplies needed to make hydrogen bombs. And so they did actually consider trying to manufacture the tritium by bombarding lithium-6 with neutrons from a nuclear weapon. You would have a pit and you would be shooting these off and blowing them up and then you would extract the tritium. This never happened because the reactor-based sources just got better. And of course, hydrogen bombs being much bigger and more powerful might actually be able to put an end to Lou Allen's big steel balls. But, you know, he, he obviously had a good reputation after this. He became a general and uh, later went on to direct uh, JPL. So he's known for more than an unorthodox way of launching bowling balls. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.